All right. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to the Freight Edge Press Showcase event, uh, where you can learn more about our books and what we publish. I'm Allison Lewis. Most of you know me as the publisher. Uh, John Parrish is with us as well. Some of you may have had contact with Monica Robinson, who does PR work and handles most of our social media. Um, so we're going to have an overview of what we publish, which is literary fiction, poetry, history and politics, our Street Smart series of short fiction. And I'm going to go over each, over each category in a little more detail. And some of our authors are here and are going to give us a taste of what, uh, what they have contributed. So first up is literary fiction. And Stealing, a novel in dreams by Shelley Brivik is a somewhat experimental novel that um, in some aspects is kind of a family drama of a dysfunctional family, two brothers and a parents. Um, and it's, it's also got experimental aspects to it, a lot of psychology, what is the nature of reality, connections between people and whatnot. Um, on the right is Right Guy, Wrong Time, a Me Too love story, which is a new adult novel, um, which if you're not familiar with that genre, subgenre, I guess I should say, it's sort of a step above young adult uh, with younger protagonists uh, in their like 20s and 30s. There tends to be, you know, more adult themes going on in this case, uh, Date rape is part of the underlying aspect to the story, um, though, as Louise likes to say, it's, it's, you know, it's not really about rape. It's about, you know, life and being a survivor and getting on with what you're doing. It's actually a very empowering read. Um, so, but trigger warning that sexual assault is in there. Uh, trigger warning for stealing is that there's some mental health issues and suicide uh, are themes. In the middle, we have a um, short story collection by James McAdams, Ambushing the Void, which deals a lot uh, with modern life technology issues like drug use and addiction and how we deal with technology in our, our world. Um, and James is with us tonight, I believe, uh, and will we'll give us a bit of a taste of what, what he's been writing. Are you there, James? No, James? Okay, so we'll move on then. <laughs> this is what we've got forthcoming in literary fiction. There'll be two translated works uh, by Jens Bjornbo, who's a, um, in some circles, a well-known Norwegian author. Uh, probably his, his most well-known work is The Sharks, and he also wrote a trilogy collectively known as The History of uh, Bestiality, which is not for the faint of heart. Uh, these are two earlier works of his. Uh, Air of the Cock Crows deals with uh, Nazi medical experiments, so not a light subject. Um, it was originally written as a play, and the translator has recreated that play from the novel in addition to translating the novel. Uh, so all that's included in that book. Winter in Bella Palma is a shorter work, a lighter work, uh, kind of a comic uh, novella of expatriates on an Italian uh, seacoast village. 
uh, we've also got another translated work coming, which is Esther Seligson's Yearning for the Sea. Uh, she's a important Mexican feminist author, which most people in the English speaking world are not aware of. And so we're very honored to be publishing this first English language tr tr translation of her work. Um, so we do have our translator of this work with us here tonight, which is Selma Marx. And she's going to tell us a little bit about Esther Seligson and give us a taste of what that is about. Now? Yes. Ah, okay. Here I go. Okay. Um, Esther Seligson uh, was born in Mexico City in 1941, and she died in 2010, also in Mexico City. Uh, she was a writer, a poet, a playwright, a translator, and a beloved professor of theater at the UNAM, the public university in Mexico City. She was not a, what you would call a popular writer in Mexico, but she was and still is a very highly regarded writer in the Mexican word, world of letters. Um, she's considered there like a writer's writer. Her work continues being published and republished in Mexico. And more recently, a compilation of her short stories was, um, was uh, published in Spain for the first time. Uh, she was profoundly interested in mythology and religion. Uh, the book I translated uh, under the title Yearning for the Sea is her rework of the myth of Penelope and Ulysses. She takes those two characters uh, in the myth as the archetype of the man-woman relationship, a concern of hers throughout her work. Um, she picks those two characters up at the point in the myth where Ulysses is returning to Penelope 20 years after the destruction of Troy. And it's in that moment of the myth that she asks, that she introduces her question, that she introduces herself with the question, what did that 20 year separation mean to this man and this woman who after having loved each other in the flower of their youth are re-encountering one another as strangers marked by the separation itself. And that is the portal through which Seligson enters into her very own confessional world of the senses, of sexual desire, of love, of its absence, of loneliness, and of nostalgia for lost time and lost youth. I am now going to read you a very short excerpt of um, Seligson's yearning. Um, it's her Penelope, herself really, searching, uh, trying to express, to put a name on the feelings and sensations that Ulysses' absence has evoked in her. An image. I am running after an image whose name I cannot find. I'm running after a name with letters I don't recognize, unpronounceable letters. And I need to talk to you, Ulysses, to talk to you in order to know if the time that I invented for myself is real, if it is true that the waiting is over, or if I have fallen, I have only fallen into another hopeless parenthesis. If I have only become entangled with words for not having hearkened to my own, for listening to them only inside me, for not embodying them, boneless worlds of mist dispersed by my own breath. To talk, yes, to recover that dialogue that does not need explanations to explain itself. The fabric woven with the threads of the little everyday things that pile up amid the silences and that burst out into words, 
like crescents coming into contact with a light beam, opening up, acquiring color. To talk of what I don't have, of what I don't know how to say, and that once I have said it allows me to receive, to learn, to touch, bashful, to talk about these, my breasts rising towards you, still full of awe and yearning for life, for the green, for the sea, for that sea you have been traversing, leaving behind my body wrapped in the memory of your last caress, a memory soon to become my shroud, a fragment of a dream bursting in the middle of my vigil, lacerating my skin, centuries on permanent watch waiting for the signal, for that game between the waiting and the fear that the waiting is over. Fear, yes, of your face, different and unknown to me, marked by unspeakable visions tempered in lands that are to me non-existent, heavy with the dew of the many eyes that must have watched you depart during those sunrise leave takings. That's it. Thank you. That's really beautiful. I think so. Yes, she's beautiful. Yeah. Um, we've got another forthcoming literary work, um, which is called In Madison's Cave. It's a kind of a historical novel in a way kind of in an epistolary fashion by Douglas Anderson. And Doug is with us tonight also, and he's going to share a little bit about his work and give us a taste. Am I on? Yep. Okay. I, I apologize for that cover mock-up. It's going to look a little bit better one of these days. Uh, in Madison's Cave, is a sort of imaginary dialogue. Allison calls it an epistolary novel. I guess that's true since it starts out, or I started it, trying to imagine why Thomas Jefferson put some very strange pictures in the only book that he ever published. They're portable sketches, and they are very strange. Some of them uh, inexplicably so riddles in a way. And I linked them up in time, when I had time after I retired from teaching. I linked them up with a remark that John Adams made to Jefferson when they were both very, very old, and were exchanging letters at the end of their lives. Adams wrote to Jefferson and said, oh, before we die, we two should explain ourselves to one another. They've been notorious enemies and close friends for 50 years. I'm having Jefferson write back to Adams and say, well, you know, here are these four strange pictures. Uh, they are my explanation. So the book that I wound up cooking up out of sentences that followed sentences follow the four pictures. And Jefferson hopes eventually to explain to his old friend why the pictures make up a machine, a machine Jefferson calls it, that's supposed to advance the complete emancipation of human nature. That's Jefferson's phrase. I swiped it from Notes on the State of Virginia. I swiped a lot of things from Notes on the State of Virginia and a lot of things from the Jefferson Adams correspondence. That's probably the best way of explaining this strange book. And um, maybe I'll just read a chunk from the first section, and that'll give you a sense of how it sounds. You don't know who the speaker is for a while, but it's Thomas Jefferson, and he's writing in a chapter called Limits, which in this book, my book, corresponds to the first chapter of Notes on the State of Virginia by the same title. Limits. The souls of men are demons, Apuleius once wrote, and though he was probably thinking of that old Greek obscurity, the daimon, I rather prefer the blunter term, the bludgeon to the liar. Diamonds could come in different forms, the good from above, the wicked from below, some blessed, some cursed, and some provocatively mixed. The last category comes as a bit of a surprise, I suspect, an untidy confusion that throws our moral drama into a terrible disarray from which 2,000 years of priests and poets have been unable to release it. Perhaps this stubborn, unruly streak explains my attraction to the mones, as the Romans called them, dwellers in shadow, crossed by vivid strips of light, or dwellers in light, broken by deep bands of shadow. 
the maddening spiritual mixtures. I have been thinking a great deal about my own manes lately, my invisible but palpable demon. More than once I have felt its presence, a faint thermal surge on an otherwise cool but perfectly still spring day, a sensation not conveyed by a passing breeze, for no breeze brings it and none disperses it. For two or three seconds at most, as I am walking in the garden or down a city street, I feel enclosed and then released as if the plasma of a fine flame were briefly bathing my torso, enveloping my face. And then as suddenly as it comes, it goes. Does it have dimensions? So it would seem since I am walking through it, but what if it is walking with me? How high does it reach? To the top of my head at least, but how much higher, who can say? Even if I should happen to have a thermometer handy in between you and me, no sensible person is whatever without a first rate thermometer, I couldn't hope to measure the temperature change to give a number to the fleeting experience. Sometimes I think it might be worth my while to design a special vest or coat with pockets inside and out that could hold six or seven useful little instruments, barometers, chronometers, miniature pendulums and spirit levels, devices for measuring wind and humidity, pulse and respiration, all primed to register their findings the instant that I step out of the house to cross the lawn. But then a little cloud of clerks would have to hover about picking my pockets every few seconds to take down the information that my instruments supplied. Reverie would be out of the question. No self-respecting Monets would bother to pay me a visit under such ludicrous conditions. And what would all these numbers be likely to tell me? That once I have taken 10 steps from my porch, I'm not the same person I was when I shut the door. But I already know that. I already know that streams do not flow backward. The numbers that matter tell me that I'm an old man, that it is now 40 years since I was 40 and went into the cave to find out for myself whether the pathway up and the pathway down were really one and the same. But I don't mean to revisit that scene just yet. The cave is at best the second of the four pictures I plan to send you, or perhaps the third. The order makes a difference, I suppose. But by the time that I'm done presenting them, I hope you will see that they are all the same picture in the end. The modes of drawing vary. Certainly the quality is erratic. The most solemn and most personal of the four is little more than a marginal sketch. The others at first glance are simply maps, but you and I can probably agree that a map is always a picture if the map reader has any imagination whatsoever. One of the four is clearly more polished than the others, it being the one that I inherited rather than the three I made myself, a public document of considerable scope of prestige a surveyor's masterpiece, but as such, no more than a masterful treatment of surfaces. I have updated it over the years as names and boundaries changed, as towns sprang up to fill in some of the blank spaces. At one point, I had it engraved, as you know, but no sooner was the engraver finished than it was out of date once more. Heraclitus would have been amused. You once wrote me that we too ought not to, ought not to die before we had explained ourselves to one another. These little drawings are my explanation. Now that I'm reviewing all four of them in my mind, perhaps I should distinguish more carefully between their outward and their inward ambitions. The first is largely a matter of costumes, by which I mean the whole decorative exterior of the natural world, as well as our own exterior ornamentation from the skin on out. We live in an age of costumes, I know, but what age hasn't sought to cover its nakedness with its vanity? Even togas and tunics, simple as they were, strove to throw a cloak of rural innocence over the depraved aristocracy of the ancient world. At least our own pigments, wigs and powders, lace ruffles, buckles and crisp silk are at worst a childish vulgarity, even if the appetites beneath all the theatrical plunder are largely unchanged. It is an odd paradox when one thinks about it, since appetites are by definition ephemeral little bodily storms that spring up and blow over. But there's an eye within each of them, I believe, a calm center where the whirling stops. For years, I thought I could capture that calm in brick and stone, make it durable, fashion a secure dwelling amid the flux or above it, perhaps. Now paper and pencil will have to do. These ramblings will make better sense once the pictures themselves are in your hands. 
You complain to me about the weakness of your eyes and the quiveration of your fingers, but the quiveration of the brain is more disabling than either. Many days now on the threshold of my ninth decade, I find that I cannot draw a straight line from one subject to another, from one thought or one task to the next. Some of my distractions have subterranean origins, or subcutanean, I should say, a shifting of urgent interior tides. If my tutors and teachers had once explained to me the golden ratio between an active mind and an empty bladder, I would have devoted my life's energies to devising a painless and effective catheter. Opening a clear channel of navigation in some rocky backcountry stream is child's play by comparison. Long before any of us have the decency to turn into dust, we are just squalid sewer systems, sluggishly coiling beneath palaces and parliaments, tenements and salons. A fleshly Venice, in fact, gaudy barges atop a pool of waste. As I reread those last few words, I'm forced to admit that I have the makings of a hot preacher in me after all. Thank you. That's the start. <laughs> Thank you. An intriguing beginning. So I'm moving on to poetry. Uh, the Splooge Factory, great title by uh, Christina Springer. Um, it's actually a series of kind of vignettes of sex workers in a um, massage parlor in Pittsburgh. A lot of wonderful voice to it, um, really drilling down into, you know, what life is like. Uh, for women in that situation. It's a kind of a unique perspective. And uh, in the middle, we've got Como Hacer Preguntas, or How to Make Questions, 69 Instructional Poems in English by Daniel Hales, uh, which has a lot more questions than answers. And I believe Daniel is with us and is going to share a little bit about his work and a taste of one of his poems. So, Daniel. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, as, as, as Allison said, that this, this book does contain and perhaps raise more questions than it actually answers, uh, but it is could potentially lead you to, to your own answers. Uh, that, that's, that's the hope. Um, but the idea of the instructional poem, it's been around a long time and it's kind of what poetry is about is how do we know what we know and how do we know that we know what we know? Uh, and when do we stop questioning that we actually know what we, we know? Um, so, yeah, um, I think I, I don't often read this one, but since this is a writing that seems primarily of other writers, um, I chose a poem from the book that is about a writer that I've really come to love in the last years. Uh, raise your hand if you're a Shirley Jackson fan. <laughs> um, so probably my favorite is, is her final novel, We've Always Lived in the Castle, which is just a really, it's just a, probably the, the greatest New England Gothic novel that there is, um, about two sisters living in this decrepit mansion, um, after one of them may or may not have murdered their parents and other family members by poisoning them. Um, and this is in the voice, this poem of Mary Cat Blackwood, who is the, uh, younger of the two sisters, and Constance Blackwood is her older sister who sort of takes care of her because Mary Cat is very much a wild child who has strange rituals, and strange beliefs, and uh, that should give you enough to at least get a sense, but if you know the book, I'm very much trying to capture that voice a little bit, the way her, her strange mind works. This is called How to Protect Your Home. 
It opens with an epigraph from Shirley from the novel. There had not been this many words sounded in our house for a long time. It was going to take a while to clean them out. How to protect your home. It's no longer enough to nail father's gold watch chain to a tree, to bury coins and blue marbles in the creek bed, baby teeth planted, only dragons nowhere. No, words must now change daily. No repeats, must never be spoken aloud. Yesterday's were turquoise, deciduous, portmanteau. And additional barriers must be built, monitored, reinforced. Crucifying a thick leather book is a beginning. But you must also curate a new kind of kindling to scatter it on the intruder's linens, feed his embers, be prepared to smash the biggest mirror in the house, splinter the familiar faces trapped inside. Because to truly protect your castle, you must be willing to risk gutting it. Roof raised, attic, a sodden museum, all 44 of uncle's chapters published as ashes, windows stoned, Dresden figurines shattered, mother's harp toppled. Yes, in the end, you may be forced to let all the intruders in, to riot on your turrets and battlements. Let them think they broke your golden harp and won. You may have to sleep some nights beside the stream slink shadows with black paws, pink pads. But as long as you have Constance, you can reclaim your castle, inventory your preserves, conjure better barricades, repair your magic till it's full again. In time, the cruelest intruders will become your humblest patrons. If they leave words on the stoop, burn them in your stove for warmth. If they offer eggs and frosted cakes, let them supplement the pumpkin pies and mushrooms you're learning to grow on the moon. Thanks, Allison. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. It's always great to hear writers in dialogue with each other, so to speak. We've also got a... Um, Another book of poetry forthcoming called The Ghetto Birds by Brian O'Hara. And this is a work of speculative poetry, which is kind of the science fiction um, subgenre of, of poetry. And uh, Brian has created a real world here. So uh, I think he's with us tonight and hopefully he'll give us a t uh, sense of of what his thinking is and tell us a little bit about what the ghetto birds are and give us a taste of some of his poetry. So Brian, take it away. Thank you, Allison. So yes, the, uh, the concept of the ghetto birds um, was initially created uh, through a dialogue that my brother and I um, were having as we were uh, basically driving to a gas station uh, in the middle of downtown Atlanta. And while we were driving, uh, my brother put on a, um, a, a tape. Yes, we were using tapes back then. <laughs> of this song from uh, a hip hop group at the time, um, back in the 90s called uh, NWA. And one of the, the song that was playing was, was called Ghetto Bird. And I, I had never heard the term before. So I, I, um, I'd asked him, okay, well, what, what the hell is a ghetto bird? And he said, it's, it's a slang term for a police helicopter. Um, so in places like South Central Los Angeles, the, the, the sound of helicopters was so common. That they were just another species of odd, evil bird. Um, and I started to kind of play with that idea. Um, I uh, went to school um, for engineering. I was initially going to uh, get a degree in aerospace engineering, learn to build spaceships, and uh, 
hang out with the, the likes of Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos, uh, who are probably roughly my age. Um, however, uh, I wound up instead doing uh, just mechanical engineering. And uh, eventually, I mean, I did this while I was in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, someplace quite far away uh, from Atlanta, both uh, physically and culturally. Um, and I hadn't planned on coming back uh, to Georgia at all. I felt like I kind of had enough of, of uh, the vibe here and wanted to experience something different. So I did eventually decide to come back and I wound up coming back in the early 90s, which I believe was kind of the heyday of the, uh, the Afrocentric movement. So the, there was a lot of stuff literarily going on and I was, I was interested in um, I just started really writing poetry in earnest. I mean, I'd always written it, but coming into this, uh, this new environment from the point of view of an engineering geek whose favorite literature was hard science fiction <laughs> uh, was a little bit difficult <laughs> when everybody else was really kind of talking about social issues. Um, and the so I wound up trying to find um, a way to, to kind of have a voice within this, you know, not coming from the, the, this quite the same uh, direction. And so I kind of took my interest in science fiction and, you know, also my interest in music and my interest in science and technology and began infusing that into uh, not just an urban setting, but also, you know, kind of moving forward into the future, uh, the ghetto birds are characters, uh, one of, among many characters in, in, this, uh, in this book. And uh, the poem I'm going to read, it's, it's a prose poem, kind of gives you an initial vibe of where they're coming from and, and what, and they have a, they have a goal. So hopefully that, uh, that goal will be made explicit in this poem. It's, uh, this is entitled The Heavy Cranes. Actually, just heavy cranes. Who am I? A casual human. I dabble in humanity. Call me Joseph No One. My enemies call me nobody. My friends call me nobody special. On the third day of Kwanzaa, a mass of circuit diagrams zigzagged up to me and slouching in the next chair made me an offer to be more than I alone could ever become. He said, you, yes, you, a dabbler in humanity, can be a part of the army of its saviors. We are the ghetto birds, singularities born in slums. We deep dream of stars, and we offer you our services as heavy cranes. Heavy cranes, huh? Sure. You see, building world is easy. It's the people that are hard to work with. You got to go for the mines. You can't just tell them to follow the drinking gourd. You got to get them to get up off the planet and head straight for the Big Dipper. And remember, we must take our worlds with us. Because sometimes it's got to be small enough to fit inside your helmet and grand enough to build a starship. So I'm going to be a pilot of one of these heavy cranes? No. Think of yourself more along the lines of a universal joint than a pilot. Wait, what? Why are you doing this? What's in it for you? Look into my circuitry and you will see human souls driving it like they stole it. My motivation is simple. It is the many of you that make me. Interesting offer. Got a guarantee? As always, no. At least you're honest. You got yourself a U-joint. How do we start? We just hold our hands. So I held the heavy crane's hands, and four more gathered around me. Their circuitry wrapped around my nerves as their struts and gears and gee jaws linked themselves to my body and to each other's. And before you could say transform, I had become a ghetto bird, a heavy crane. 
Our first task was to resurrect the junkie jellymen. In this city of rundown dreams, crook lights and evil dead hoopties, dirty syringes sang. Let's go out to the crack house. Let's go out to the crack house. Let's go out to the crack house and grab ourselves some smack. And the junkie jelly men and women wiggled and jiggled to the jingle as the jabberwocks on their backs fed the bolts to their back brains. I and the other heavy cranes took metal old computer parts and invoked the power of Shaft, Shaka, and Fred G. Sanford to build skeletons for these unstructured ones. My first case was one mini the moocher, most slap together ghetto rig job I've ever done. But the bones did power up. They slipped under her skin and began converting the jabberwock into a backup power source. As mini the moocher awoke from her slumber, I packed away my gee jaws, assumed human form and made her the offer. Like a professional dabbler in humanity, she asked for a guarantee. Like a newborn heavy crane, I said flatly, there ain't one. She dug my architecture and asked for the how-to. We held hands. Remember this, we got a small world in our hands, so keep it under your helmet. Who do we give it to? Everyone. And that's it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Something to look forward to. Moving along, we've got history and politics where we're sort of trying to resurrect some hidden voices in a way. Um, a nurse's story deals with um, a, a woman who was a Ohio farm girl who went to the big city, got a nursing degree, uh, became a medical missionary in Korea at a time when women didn't really even travel on their own, uh, was training Korean nurses when World War I started and got called up to uh, serve in a Red Cross unit on the Eastern Front of um, World War I. Uh, with lots of adventures along the way of taking trains across Siberia and, um, you know, setting up typhoid hospitals and going back to Korea and Seoul at a time when the um, revolution was just starting to happen there. So kind of a unique story. Um, in the middle, we've got Jeremiah Hacker, journalist, anarchist, Abolitionists, written by Rebecca Pritchard. Rebecca is with us tonight. She's going to tell us a little bit about who Hacker was and give us a little taste of her book as well. So Rebecca, feel free to unmute and dive in. Can you hear me? Um. Jeremiah Hacker is a 19th century journalist and um, and I guess you could call him a, a radical reformer um, from New England. He was from Portland, Maine. And I first met Jeremiah Hacker in the library, the Maine Historical Society Library. Um, when I read his newspaper, The Pleasure Boat, I have a copy here today, um, Portland Pleasure Boat. I'm very lucky to have a few of these. Um, but I'll just dive right in and, and read about him because um, because you'll see why he's, he's so interesting. Um, the book is divided into two halves. One is biographical, um, The Life of Jeremiah Hacker. And the second half is delving more into his ideas and his writings. Um, so I'm gonna read you the introduction to the second half. Jeremiah Hacker wrote The Pleasure Boat for 17 years and The Chariot of Wisdom and Love for another three years. 
Hacker's Pleasure Boat, the, the short-lived New Jersey paper, added another year to the total. In his 21 years worth of writing, Hacker revealed his unique worldview, making especially clear that he longed for a world without government or organized religion. Though he did not lay out a detailed plan of how to achieve this, the cause of land reform was central to his goal. Hacker believed that if everyone could own enough land to support himself, and no one could own more land than he could use, there would be no distinction between rich and poor. If everyone had his or her material needs met, there would be no crime. If there was no crime, there would be no need of laws. Without laws, there would be no need of government. What Hacker envisioned was an agrarian utopia where people would work to support themselves, look after their neighbors, and answer to no government other than, Hacker's quote, the government of truth in their own minds. In a society where land determined wealth, Packer's vision was radical, but not unreasonable. In fact, similar ideas on land reform had been proposed by other reformers. Packer's arguments had a certain logic to them and were embraced by other radicals of his era. This half of the book breaks down Hacker's overall worldview into sections based on the recurring themes Hacker discussed. The themes of poverty, popular reform movements, land reform, Government, organized religion, women's rights, and juvenile justice will be discussed separately and also in connection with each other. On April 1, 1845, the pleasure boat began. We have hoisted our flag and launched our little boat upon the waters of love and are ready to receive passengers on an, ex on an excursion of pleasure. Jeremiah Hacker, the captain of the vessel, quickly qualified what kind of pleasure he meant. He did not mean drinking, dancing, or otherworldly pleasure. He meant that pure present and eternal pleasure in which the immortal spirit of man lives and breathes. Hacker's goal was to voyage over sea and land, pointing out things that were truly useful and instructive, as well as dangers like whirlpools of sin and misery. And the pirates, the false pirates, pilots, and the land sharks, and other enemies of humanity. The pleasure boat abounded, abounded in the language of the sea. The newspaper was not numbered in volumes and issues, but was identified by clearances and excursions. It was not organized into articles and columns, but by cabins and decks, such as Pirate's Cabin and Promenade Deck. Hacker himself was not the editor and sole contributor, but the owner, master, and crew. He did not employ this specialized language merely to be clever, rather it was metaphorical. The boat was his vehicle, of truth and also a vessel with which to pick up passengers or followers to help him in his cause. Other language eccentricities reveal something about Hacker and his mindset. For example, he rejected Americanized English and opted instead for British spellings and phrases such as color with a U and gibbet. His, this was likely a product of his Quaker education as he grew up reading the journals and essays of George Fox and other notable British Quakers. His choice of language could also have been reflected his resistance to American patriotism. Whenever he mentioned money, he did not use American currency. Again, he preferred British nomenclature as when he claimed to his readers that he would rather die by the gibbet than pay one farthing in taxes to support a warring government. Packer used Quaker terminology when referring to days and months. Days were not called by their traditional names because they had roots in North Norse mythology and were therefore pagan. Sunday was called first day and were numbered on from there. Months were similarly numbered beginning with January as first month. Packer made extensive use of biblical terminology. And this again was similar to the old Quaker texts he grew up reading. Borrowing from the Old Testament, he called Portland the city of modern Gath, a condemnation of its sinfulness. He called ministers of the church priests of Baal, which was a favorite epithet of the Old Testament prophets, who used it against anyone they felt did not worship the true God. He, told, he sold his newspapers on the street to publicans and sinners, terms from the New Testament Gospels, which 19th century Portlanders who were well-versed in religion would have been familiar with though the term publican had long since been replaced by the less biblical term of tax collector. Hacker often used tender language as if to wrench 
the hearts of his readers and appeal to their emotions. Nowhere is this more evident than when his writing, when he was writing about social problems and proposed reforms. And from there, the book goes into what Hacker said about social problems and proposed reforms. Um, but before I leave you, I want to share with you one more quote of Hacker, which is one of my favorites. And it really goes to his, um, his ideas about um, not supporting government. Um, he said, my object has been my object has not been to reform the leaders. They're at present too intent on unrighteous gain, too earnest after the loaves and the fishes to listen. They would only regard my testimony as the rattle of the pleasure boat. My work is with the people. So that's a little taste of um, Jeremiah Hacker. Um, thank you for the opportunity to read. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Hacker's a fascinating character and um, Although this is very grounded in history, I find that there's, you know, a lot in his ideas that are still relevant today. And Hacker was somebody who was well known and controversial in his time. And that's something uh, he shares in common with Hugh Owen Pentecost, who's a little uh, closer to us in time. And we hope to get this set of books out, uh, Do Not Misunderstand Me, which is a quote from him, this um, is envisioned as the collected addresses of Hugh Owen Pentecost to the Unity Congregation, who he, he was a, a minister in a Christian denomination and then kind of branched off into a non-denominational um, group called the Unity Congregation, and he was actually preaching in three different, um, three different locations every Sunday, and his, his uh, addresses were published in a paper that they were producing, and these have all been gathered together for the very first time. Like Hacker, he was dealing with a lot of social issues um, that still resonate with us today, including things like land reform um, and uh, things like the death penalty and other things. So this is kind of a massive undertaking, but we're hoping to have this out sometime next year. So finally, we've got a series of short fiction called the Street Smart series. And number one was Full Fair by Jean-Bernard Puy, who's actually well known in France. Um, and he was the inspiration for starting the series because they have these series of like novelette length books that you can buy in train stations in France. And he started this whole series of them that were very popular but he's been considered untranslatable because he uses so much slang and it took a crack team of three translators to get what, this one out. Um, this wasn't intentional, but the first three numbers of this series have sort of an anarchist uh, thread to them. Down and Out in Paris with Cat deals with a American expatriate living in Paris who identifies as an anarchist and uh, is also a recovered alcoholic who falls off the wagon and his life goes from bad to worse uh, until a stray cat shows up in his yard and they kind of end up saving each other in a way. The Accidental Anarchist is a story of a, a woman who decides to ditch work one day, hop on a bus and go to New York City, takes a turn down the wrong alley and finds herself mixed up in what becomes an anarchist bomb plot. But the anarchists are the good guys because they're actually trying to foil a human <coughs> trafficking scheme that uh, the police are not paying attention to. Um, the second two numbers have more of a, a more traditional kind of law and uh, law and, and detective angle to them. Stealing MacGuffin is set in contemporary Baltimore, 
but it's sort of contemporary noir where there's a detective and there's the loyal sidekick and there's a dame and there's uh, an evil uh, an evil bad guy and his henchmen and there's kind of a twist ending uh, so there's some familiar tropes there in kind of a contemporary setting. Pele's Domain is uh, pretty much a police procedural, but it's got um, an interesting setting of Hawaii and an interesting main character of a young uh, rookie female police officer. And um, our author, Albert Tucker, is here with us tonight, and he can tell us a little bit more about this uh, world he's created and give us a taste of his work as well. So take it away, Albert. Thanks, Allison. Um, yeah, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, these, this is one of my uh, Big Island of Hawaii stories. They have a, an ensemble cast. Most of them are officers and detectives from the Hawaii County Police, but there's also a veteran marijuana dealer and a criminal defense attorney. Jenny Freitas, the young uniformed officer, has really been taking over lately. I, I invented her basically to plug a small plot hole and she has just expanded. Um, in Pele's domain, she tangles with a serial killer who is using the recent volcanic eruption to cover his crimes. And in the excerpt I'm gonna read, <clears throat> Jenny has just discovered a murder victim in a doomed house just seconds before the lava overwhelms it. The walls of the house have provided a little insulation against the worst of the heat. Outside, Jenny's face felt ready to melt. She looked toward Kilauea, which had been pumping lava on and off for years, but now Jenny couldn't trust the ground she stood on. Streets that children crisscrossed on their bikes had been splitting open without warning and hurling the boiling bowels of the planet into the air. Just 50 yards away, a glowing orange tide plowed through the rainforest. Some trees toppled while others ignited where they stood. Splashes of lava leaped and sprawled like boiling surf, but no board in the world could ride this wave. The din assaulted her. Boulders banged together as the lava rolled them along. One rock exploded and then another. Even as she ran, Jenny flinched and then wondered about the physics behind the phenomenon. If she lived through this, she might ask a geologist about it. Those were just the noises she could pick out of the crowd. They seemed to float on the, on the roar of the Earth's molten core. She churned her feet faster toward the Hawaii County Ford Escape waiting in the clearing in front of the house. The passenger, passenger door stood open. Jenny dove into the front seat and landed with her head in Sammy's lap. Neither of them had time for embarrassment. Sammy floored the accelerator and turned left hard. Jenny pulled her feet into the vehicle as the passenger door's own momentum slammed it shut. She squirmed upright and looked back. The house was aflame, fully involved in a way that usually took minutes instead of seconds. Damn, girl, said Sammy. What are you trying to do to me? Do to you? If the lava doesn't kill me, your mother will. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot of action there to get us get us going right at the beginning. So, uh, just to give you a taste of some of the illustrations in the Street Smart series, um, on the left we've got Uncle Gee, who's on the tramp train in the full fare piece. In the middle, we've got our hapless American in front of an ornate Parisian door, and you can see the cat in the box with the little eyes peeping out. And on the right, we've got Officer Jenny, who's, who's a small person, but she can handle her perp. Uh, <laughs> so I hope you enjoy seeing those. Um, and just a word about our future publishing plans. I've mentioned the, you know, works that are forthcoming on the left-hand column here, and uh, hopefully next year, the, the Pentecost work. And beyond that, uh, we are looking for more Street Smart 
series titles and uh, we've got other things under consideration, novel, possible short story collection, a possible nonfiction work dealing with Latin America, and uh, additional poetry. So if you know, know artists who might fit with us, uh, let them know. You can visit us at freightedgepress.com and there's contact uh, form there if you need to get in touch. And so we have time for questions and discussion, if anybody cares to. I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to say it was a really interesting set of presentations. What a diverse group. I, I kind of wanted to buy everybody's work. And I guess that's the whole point. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun to listen to everybody. <laughs>